Okay, again, my name is Alish um, Urbanchik, and I'm responsible for the training programs of the European Guild for Structural Integration. Now, my presentation tonight is going to be somewhat more philosophical. So maybe over the entire evening, we will get a good left-right brain balance after Antonio's presentation. So the title of your event is Modern Fascial Treatment Conference. And I think any modern treatment is modern because it stands on the history of many years of work of other people working in that direction. I'm going to attempt to retrace part of that history as it relates to the approach I practice, the Rolf method of structural integration. And I will take a look at the aphorism Ida Rolf coined, gravity is the therapist. But first, I want to pick up on the theme of Antonio's presentation and show you what Ida Rolf's view was on fascial densifications more than 50 years ago without MRI or fascial scans and from a time when fascia was considered by many people in the scientific community as dead film material. This whole collection of rack fascial. Okay. Organs and so forth is wrapped in what amounts to a shopping bag, an external bag that is called the superficial fascia. And these various fascial planes and fascial bags hold that body together. But all of them are connected one to another. This is a model of two muscles designed to show how muscles work and how muscles fail to work. Many muscles cross one another. Others lie adjacent to each other. When a myofascial structure is injured, and this can happen in an accident, or it can happen through such a thing as a dose of flu that gets in an area where there are muscles. But at any rate, whenever a myofascial structure is injured, it secretes various semi-fluid materials which should really improve the uh, movement of muscles and does really well and is semi-fluid but then it dries on and the semi-fluid material becomes a glue it will be a glue between the, the fascia the envelope of the fascia and the envelope of the fascia of this muscle and that glue prevents it from really working independently and so when this muscle is pulled it is impeded by its by the glue that is sticking those two fascial envelopes together and so when we call on this muscle for movement what we really get is this muscle impeded by that muscle and so there is not free movement and so every attempt at moving that muscle requires more energy because you have to move both this muscle and that muscle. As I said before, the collagen tissue is a very special tissue. It's a very special kind of a, of a complicated protein tissue. And it is special in the sense that by the application of energy, you can change its length and its resilience now, as the Rolfa applies energy at this point, perhaps, and this point, at any rate, in the neighborhood of the place where the tissue is built up into something of a hard little knot, as he applies energy there, the glue seems to dissolve. And all of a sudden, he feels under his fingers that one muscle is moving on the other muscle freely and that these two muscles can begin to operate in their respective directions, in the direction called for by their design. And if so this, this far, Ida Rolf, um, a couple of years later, her work had become so popularized that it served as a parody in, a, in an American comedy. And I just want to show you three minutes of this, okay? To była Ida Rolf i kilka lat później praca i twórczość stała się tak znana, że pojawiła się nawet w komedii, pojawiła się parodia jej pracy. Pants, 
Ну и все, ждем. Ну и... Париап, я понял, что ремень. Ливан и Андрюбы. You are having trouble. Lie down on the table. On your belly. You understand felting? No? No. <laughs> you will find out. I'm not sure I want to. You are going to. Head on. Felting rebalances oh. the body. Oh. By moving oh. the tissue. Around the muscles, so the muscles are once again free. Ow! There's nothing wrong with my muscles. Your muscles are disgusting. Big, lumpy, typical athlete's muscles. Wait! Oh. 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 Now this hurts. Ah! Oh. Yes. You think this crazy old lady is killing me, no? Right. Ah, wrong. Pain is coming from you, uh, not from me. Ow! I do only the moving. Throw it over. Take a deep breath. Very good. You feel lighter in your chest already? No? You're still resisting. Relax. Breathe in. And out. Good. You can scream if you want. Release the emotion. If I scream, will you stop? No. There is no movement without him. Ah! Ah! You hated your father, no? Oh. Your mother, no? Oh. Oh. You had sexual problems? No. All American men have sexual problems. Relax. Open your mouth. No. Open your mouth. Lift up the tongue. What? You find out. Ah! Very good. Now you can pick up. Can I go home now? No, no, no. Oh my God. Oh no. No, I remember that from the army. You're not going to do that. To this me. is for the nose. For the nose? The inside of the nose is a reflection of the personality. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. I will do anything you want if you don't do it. You understand what I'm saying? I will do anything you want. We just started. So the um, <laughs> the obvious um, disconnect in the message between these two films maybe demonstrate best the kind of confusion that has always surrounded the public perception of structural integration. The clip we just saw was from the 1977 movie Semi-Tough with Burt Reynolds as a football player seeking help from Clara Pelf, a barely disguised pun on Ida Rolf. Ida Rolf, whose life work we're discussing today, of course, did not originally call her work Rolfing. She called it structural integration, and her first school bore the name Guild for Structural Integration. She was born in 1896 in New York and grew up in the Bronx. Her interest in the human physical body originally came from concerns about her own health. As a young woman, she had been struck by a horse's hoof in the chest and had developed symptoms that looked like pneumonia. Since the usual pneumonia treatments did not have any effect, she tried the help of an osteopath who put a very twisted rib back into place and immediately she could breathe again freely. 
In her own words, she says, I got to be friends with my osteopath and I became very interested in the theory of osteopathy that uh, structure determines function. A contemporary seeker later in life was Moshe Feldenkrais. He and I were all were friends, they were rivals and in endless discussions about the proper approach. Ida Roth's structural integration was based on her view of the fascial body being the determining factor, which stood against Feldenkrais's functional integration based on muscle. Yeah. She came from the stillness of yoga. He came from the movement of judo. They hated and they loved each other. And on her 80th birthday, Moshe Feldenkrais wrote to Ida Rolf, I would like you to know that I know a few people of your intellectual integrity. I mean, people who created something and do exactly what they say they're doing. So what exactly was it that Ida Rolf created? I hope I will be able to demonstrate that structural integration does not merely constitute another technique, but it is an invitation to take up a different point of view, to look at a human body through a different set of glasses. Structure determines function. This equation was to become Ida Rolf's main field of study until her death in 1979. Let's track back a little bit first. We're still in New York in 1917 with the world in flames and American soldiers fighting in Europe. The men off to war, the chance for the women to study and work. Ida Rolf graduated from Barnard College in 1916 and then went on to work on her PhD in biological chemistry at Columbia's College of Physicians and Surgeons and in the chemistry department of the Rockefeller Institute. The Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 was decimating not only whole populations, but also whole regiments of soldiers, and all institutions in the United States were contributing to the war effort. Idarov's work was centered on the nature of phosphatides, and in particular, lecithin. Within the context of the flu pandemic, it is very well possible that her work was contributing to the understanding of how the influenza virus managed to destroy cell membrane. But Idarov's interests had always been very, very diverse. You might call her a Renaissance personality. And once the dust had settled on the battlefields of Europe, Ida Rolf, on a leave of absence from the Rockefeller Institute, went on to study physics in Zurich and homeopathy in Geneva, Switzerland. Homeopathy and physics, this is how far her interests went. The scientist Ida Rolf, who according to credible sources always carried a pendulum in her handbag, would later say, all this metaphysics is fine, but be mighty sure you got physics underneath the metaphysics. Sam Johnson, a colleague in the United States, concluded after extensive research that Ida Rolf had to choose between two paradigms, Hippocrates and Descartes. Hippocrates had seen health as a reflection of balance in the body, and illness consequently was a result of imbalance. Consequently, internal, internal imbalance caused by living habits, environmental hygiene, etc., led to disease. From that idea followed the belief that if a physician could intervene in such a way that balance was restored in the body, illness could be healed. The 17th century then saw a gigantic paradigm shift. René Descartes published his Discours de la méthode, which laid the foundation for the development of the scientific approach we still know today. This was a crucial change. The scientific method could, would give scientists a schema for studying nature. It gave reductionism its tool to study the parts of things systematically. The biochemist and yogini Ida Rolf was fascinated by both. She ultimately chose Hippocrates and in some ways started a bold attempt to bridge the gap between him and Descartes. Back from her studies in Switzerland, back she was in New York. Structural integration started nearly accidentally. Ida Rolf had made the acquaintance of a lady in New York who had been doing unusually inspiring musical work with children, and Ida Rolf wanted this lady to teach her children play the piano. 
But the lady had badly hurt her arms in uh, falling on a hole in the New York pavement and was unable to play. And the tools the medical profession offered had been exhausted. Ida Rolf speaks herself about this like this. I looked at Ethel and said, I bet I can fix this. Do you trust me to try? You can't be worse off. I will make yeah. you a bargain. If I can get you to a place where you can teach music, will you teach my children? So I started with yoga exercises, which I myself was using at that point. After we worked together for about four times, she was in good enough shape to start teaching music. And that's where structural integration really started, because of course, Ethel had a friend who hadn't been able to get help, and this friend had a friend, and so on and so forth. The next 30 years of her life, Ida Rolf spent working with people and developing the ideas and methods of structural integration before she systematically started teaching. Here's a picture of the Esalen Institute, commonly simply called Esalen. It's a non-profit American retreat center. The Institute played a key role in the human potential movement in the 1960s. And one of the big uh, therapists at Esalen there was Fritz Perls. And he, the founder of Gestalt Therapy, was the one who called Ida Rolf to Esalen and asked her to, to really teach there. Fritz Perls describes his encounter with Ida Rolf in an interview like this. And Ida Rolf really helped you with your heart trouble? This I cannot say. She certainly helped me with the main symptom, those spasms and gyna pectoris pains that made life so miserable that I was willing to end it all. In this sense, she saved my life. Ida has a holistic outlook. She looks at the whole body and tries to um, relocate whatever is out of balance. She tears the sheath around the muscles apart to give the muscles breathing space, as she says, and she stimulates atrophied muscles. This tearing must be pretty painful. While well, sometimes agonizing, I usually have a cigarette break after 20 minutes. She claims she needs cooperation. This is why she doesn't do it under anesthesia. In some places, the muscle tissue is imploded and she works until you let go of the spasm. One day, I will be a naughty boy and try to be rolfed under nitrous oxide, laughing gas. So what is the connection with your heart trouble? In angina pectoris, the muscles around your heart and the left arm become very painful. This is probably nature's way of stopping you from overworking your sick heart. So Ida opened up the cramps and all those muscles and I could breathe freely. I also had sometimes very painful, paralyzing back aches, which have improved about 80 to 90%. Altogether, you see that I have all the reasons to be deeply grateful. What kind of a person is she? A very powerful, big angel. So here at Esalen, the, sometimes the clients and students started saying that had, they had just gotten rolfed. And they, in some ways, created the nowadays common expression of Rolfing, which has been licensed by the Dr. Ida Rolf Institute in Boulder, Colorado. So what is structural integration all about? Ida Rolf would have said the purpose of structural integration is to guide the body into a better balance with the field of gravity. This, of course, sounds great, but how can this be accomplished and where do we start? One of the diagnostic tools used in structural integration is a visual analysis of simple standing. Ida Rolf was bold. In her book, Rolfing, the Integration of Human Structure, published in 1977, she called fascia there the basic organ of structure. Ida Rolf always chose her words wisely, and when she said organ, she meant organ. She was convinced that this organ of structure was innovated. She was also convinced that its overall shape could be manipulatively modified, and if a client brought enough awareness to the table, this improved balance would allow gravity to flow through the system in a way that it supported the organism and did not tear it down. So, she would have said, as an all matter organized into biological units, there is a pattern, an order in human bodies. Rolfers make a life study of relating bodies and their fields to the earth and its gravity field. 
We Perfect. so organize the body that the gravity field can reinforce the body's energy field. If we turn this argument around, we, will, we can say, in order to counteract the downward pull of gravity, a badly aligned body will have to create additional elements of support. Well, these, these elements of support can then be felt as thickening, shortenings, and densifications in the myofascial webbing of the body. And these densifications then force muscles to work even harder against gravity, which causes more hardening of fascia. So it becomes a vicious circle. There is nothing in a human body that um, resembles the structure of a house, like a wall supporting the roof. So in a sloppy way, using a tensegrity analogy, we could say a human body functions more like a tent than it does like a house, architectonically. So the kind of good posture you see on the right can only be assumed once there is a reasonable amount of structural integrity. So a good structure does not have anything to do with holding against gravity. On the contrary, it has something to do with trusting to allow things to let go. It has a lot to do with trusting the gravitational field to carry you. And it has to do with an awareness or meditation which Ida Rolf called the line in the picture on the right. So a local densification of fascia for Ida Rolf would be the result of a disorganization of the entire fascial body. She would have sought not to look at that local problem, but would work towards a greater balance of the whole person so that the organism did not have the necessity to, to create a local densification. The legendary Czech professor of um, anatomy, Professor Levitt, and Ida Rolf, they didn't know each other, but their thinking was in similar lines. Mně se z oboru, když jsem pak už studoval, nejlíp, líbila neurologie. Pro takovou určitou preciznost, která má. Tedy začala být novou aktualitou páteř a destičky. Poněč, Šlo o otázku mechanickou, která se dala operovat, tak jsem si řekl, no, jestli se to nedá mechanicky ovlivnit neoperačně. Nejjednodušší bylo jenom zatáhnout. A k mému překvěpení takový jednoduchý trakčí manévry za nohy nebo za hlavu dávali někdy Klinické efekty. Zatáh jsem na nohu, pacient řekl, no, teď, teď to tak nebolí. Tak to mě bavilo. Pak se stala věc tak trochu charakteristická pro socialismus. Tady existovala starší baba, která napravovala. A tak se rozhodlo, že ona musí prokázat, že to, co dělá, není pouhým podvodem. A tak putovala na rozkaz ministerstva po různých zařízeních klinických, až doputovala ke mně. Já jsem se na to podíval a to jsem řekl, beru. A tak ona musela na kliniku jednou nebo dvakrát týdně a já jenom dělal záznamy. Ale jednou dnes jsem si rozhodl, že to zkusím. A to jsem zjistil, že to mám odkoukaný. Já 
Já si v technice, co jsem tehdy u ní odkoukal, nepoužívám ani jednu desku. To je dávno věk, to je věk ještě barbarský. My jsme trochu prokřičení ve světě tím, že zdůrazňujeme funkční poruchy. Dá se to pochopit, když vám auták přestane fungovat, tak může to být, že jste rozběla nějaká hřídel, kulečkový rozřízko nebo něco takového. Ale když mu rozštělujete zapalování nebo karburaci, tak vám taky nepojede. A přitom, když je rozštělovaná zapalování, tak struktury jsou úplně zdraví. Jenom je to rozštělovaný. A to řízení organismu je o tolik složitější než takový motor. Oni se všude učí najít v té biochemii a v té anatomii něco strukturální, za co se můžou chytit a říct, tohle je nemocný. Tady to je a tam musíte zasáhnout. A mi říká, není to tak. Ta souhra všech těchto věcí je někde porušena. A teď ji hledajte. Oni popisují všelijaké změny v oblasti ramen a svalů. Ale se spálná většina těch lidí musí naučit dýchat, to vůbec neví. Podívat, že nemyslí v souvislostech. Oni jsou zaměřeni na strukturu a ono je to s tím dalším horší. Ten medic je fascinován a ty profesoři taky tím porkolem té techniky. Oni stále věří víc a víc, že když ještě vylepší to a to, že musí na to přijít, že tam ta porucha, že jenom na to nepřišli, protože nemají ještě dost dobrý instrument a ten jim to ukáže. A když musí jim změnit celý myšlení, to na to nepřijdou. A já hlavně na tom čistě funkčním přístupu nemá zájem ani farmakologický, ani přístrojový průmysl. A to nelze podceňovat, podívat. Veškeré publikace, veškeré kongresy, to je všechno financované prakticky tím průmyslem. Ta skrytá korupce je obrovská. Přístroje vlastně nám ty v souvislosti téměř neodhalí a nejsou nám při praktické práci k ničemu. Takže my to děláme klinicky. A tomu se říká subjektivní. A to když je nevědecky. V každém jazyce, když někdo něčemu rozuměl, tak to pochopil. A když něco umí, tak to má vymakaný. Tedy člověk přirozeně to, co vidí, to se může mýlit, ale to, co si vomáká, tomu rozumě. Ale dnešní věda říká pravý opak. Vy nemůžete dneska v práci, který by vám v časopisech přijmoli, pracovat s palpací. Palpace je úžasně jemný a rafinovaný způsob vyšetřování. Když šáhnete na pacienta, tak ten pacient reaguje. Tu jeho reakci já můžu palpačně registrovat. Tím vzniká vzájemná vazba mezi pacientem a léčitelem. Což je samozřejmě z hlediska praktické terapie nesmírný plus. Jenomže je to zpětná reakce mezi dvěma soustavami, který nelze napodobit. To již neplatí ve vědě. A 
A to bylo tak, nemůžou buzerovat, ale ty pacienti ke mně stejně půjdou a, a i ty funkcionáři ke mně půjdou. A když máte takovou školu, tak se nestratíte. A to byla pravda. Mě nezajímá perspektivy krátky. Já musím vědět, ta věc je nosná. A ať potom mám s tím nepříjemnosti, nebo nevono se to prosadí. Tohle funkční stanovisko, jak to tady prosazujeme, to je na příští století. Ono se to musí prosadit mm. totiž. Poněž díky, díky moderní civilizaci se davím zamyslení, těch funkčních poruch stále přibývá. A oni nemůžou je zvládat jenom tím, že čumí na rentgeny a snaží se nějakou strukturu ovlivnit. Nemůžou. Já to vidím na těch výsledcích. To není, že dělám nějaké zázraky. Prostě je to jiný přístup. The question that he would always ask is why is that local problem there? What is the overall organism can't do that it creates this local problem? And um, he he jokes, now we can play detective where the problem is. Either Rolf basically solved this problem but said we're not going to play detective. We're going to create a protocol um, that will just reorganize the entire fascial web work. In, a, in, in the preface of her book, 1977, the first line in the description of the book says, osteopaths traditionally have manipulated fascial tissue locally to relieve specific instances of stress or injury. However, the idea of reorganizing a person's fascial structure as a whole and thereby realigning the entire body seems to have occurred to no one before either of. So Idarov created a system of um, basic series of 10 sessions to reorganize the entire fascial network. Sometimes when people hear this, they will be surprised that everyone is taken through this protocol regardless of the problem they originally come with. And some people would call this approach mechanistic. In actuality, the basic series of structural integration is far from being mechanistic. Every one of these sessions has a very specific goal and a relatively clearly defined territory. But of course, the detailed intent of a session has to be adapted to the structure of the client. You will, in a second session, always work on the feet and the knees. But you will obviously work on them differently if the client has a tendency to X legs or has a tendency to O legs. And you will work even more differently if there has been some traumatic event like a fracture in the territory of that session. So the result of a basic series is usually then shown in these pre and after pictures. And with very few exceptions, for instance, people suffering from connective tissue illnesses, anyone, regardless of their age, sex, or injury history, can work with structural integration. Here's a couple of pictures of me working with a child, for instance. One of the, one of the byproducts for many people who have gone through this basic series are surprisingly enough psychological changes. Many people report being more self-assured, less troubled by little things, more centered, calmer, or better able to stand up for themselves. This for Ida Rolf was a big, big surprise. She said, the amazing psychological changes that appeared in individuals that had undergone a process of structural integration were completely unexpected. The psychological effect here is far greater than one would expect to induce in the brief encounter of 10 hours. And so she added, structural integration thus postulates on the basis of observation that a human being is basically an energy field operating in the greater energy field of the Earth. Particularly significant is that energy known as the gravitational field. So, on the basis of observation, Eiderolf started off with a Hippocratean idea. Create balance within the myofascial web of the human body relative to the energy field in which it moves, the field of gravity. She coined the aphorism, gravity is the therapist. 
Today we're starting to bring Descartes into the equation. At the beginning, scientists at the fascial research congresses at first were, were skeptical because fascia was not something they had explored a lot. The last fascial research congress was in Berlin, the next one is planned next year in Montreal, and the European Guild is a sponsor of both events. We are interested, very much interested in fascial research, and we're particularly interested in the research of our specific modality. Not much research has been done yet on this basic series of structural integration. But just recently, the first really bigger study came out. So anyway, what, I, I just want to credit um, one of our practitioners, Gregor Jedrzejewski, in, in collaboration with Martina Kaspar Jedrzejewska, Pavel Dolibor, Renata Shigula, Robert Schleib, and Tomasz Hauliski, who published first results on a study on the effects of the basic series of structural integration. A larger follow-up study is currently being conducted on the models of our basic trainings in Prague and Warsaw. And one of our instructors, Adam Polanski, is in the process of writing his PhD thesis on that subject. Now, Ida Rolf was way ahead of her time. A lot of the things she claimed on the basis of observation are starting to stand the test of scientific research. Some of them may ultimately have a different rationale behind them than either all originally thought. And of course, after all, we claim that we don't want to take on people who are not going to have at least 10 hours because we want to establish an, uh, an essential verticality. Basically, we feel ourselves not therapists. We feel that we are teachers. And my expression of this is that, that that we are not therapists under any circumstances that it is the gravitational field that is the therapist what we do is to prepare the body to receive the support from the gravitational field which gives the greater sense of well-being serious traumatic episodes also leave their mark and later in life a person goes to a psychotherapist of some sort expecting to get those dug out but actually those very serious traumatic episodes are anchored literally in the flesh of the body and until the flesh of the body is made is freed so that it can move appropriately to the pattern the traumatic episode cannot really be erased from that body forgotten it's not possible to me, personality is not a mental thing, but to me, personality expresses uh, a two-sided coin on one of which side, one side is the, is the physical and one side is the mental. And a serious change in either one will most certainly result in a serious change in the other. Always people are innovators by virtue of the fact that they have come up against a problem to which there is no answer. In the, in the accepted field, in the conventional field. And so they set about trying to find out what is the answer, what can give them a help with their problem. I had a child who had certain problems that I couldn't find help for in the accepted field. And so I started looking around trying to find out what were the elements in this child's problem which could be changed because always you have to change your premise in order to get a different conclusion. Integracja strukturalna w czystej formie zawsze postrzega lokalny problem jako symptom globalnej dezorganizacji. Proponuje systematyczny program zmiany wzorców posturalnych poprzez pracę z tkanką łączną oraz reedukację ruchową. Zwykle proces ten zawiera się w podstawowych 10 sesjach, a każda z nich dotyczy innego obszaru ciała i posiada określone cele. Ida Rolf, twórczyni integracji strukturalnej, tak opisuje zależność człowieka i siły grawitacji. W integracji strukturalnej mamy zamiar wykonać cykl 10 sesji. Jest ku temu powód. Nie mamy do czynienia z lokalnym problemem i podejściem typu po prostu to naprawię i na tym koniec. Mamy tu do czynienia z próbą poprawy funkcjonowania całego ciała w polu grawitacyjnym, zwiększenia jego wydajności oraz uzyskanie poczucia większego bezpieczeństwa. 
Przejście przez proces rekonstrukcji, jakim jest integracja strukturalna, zwiększa szanse organizmu na samodzielne rozwiązanie problemu. La cosa fantastica dell'integrazione strutturale è che sfrutta la, la capacità elastica e plastica del tessuto fasciale e, ed è in grado veramente di, di trasformare il modo in cui una persona sta in piedi, si muove, si percepisce nello spazio. Mój kolega, z którym pracowałam w przychodni, pracował tą metodą i pacjenci byli absolutnie zachwyceni, po czym spróbowałam tej terapii na sobie i to naprawdę jest magiczna podróż. Nasze interwencje niegdy stoczy, aby były bardzo jemne, można mniej pracy, często znamená lepszy wysledek. Learning structural integration takes quite some time, it's not easy. You need to be immersed in a class situation and have teachers around that know what they're doing that can help you to learn. It's um, coming from the inside of you, which makes it even better. And then every person you work on is like an adventure.